a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm glad you're with me today. We're going to be talking... Well, we're going to be talking about what uh, the uh, anti-gun activists who are going after Jason Aldean don't want to talk about, and that is crime in the big city. No, they'd much rather talk about songs about small towns and how awful it is that uh, Jason Aldean would be singing about uh, keeping guns and not handing them over when uh, they come to round them up. Meanwhile, you know, we've got uh, some serious issues going on in big cities that uh, gun control activists like Shannon Watts do not want to discuss. They want to make this conversation all about how dare uh, Jason Aldean sing these songs while ignoring what's actually happening in places like our nation's capital. We'll get to that in just a second. But before we do, Biden's America is crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers one after the other. Americans working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch meat the next time you go to the grocery store. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy our way of life. Truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that's why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-time Inc. 5000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year, with thousands of five-star reviews, and they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last, and if you call them today... Qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin, so don't wait. Call 855-412-3806 today. That's Gold Co. at 855-412-3806. So, by the way, Jason Aldean's song, number one on the charts, so I guess he could thank Shannon Watts for that, uh, even as a CMT has uh, pulled the music video. But we're not going to talk about Jason Aldean, because, again, that's what the gun controllers want us to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what's actually happening in big cities across the country, including in Washington, D.C., where juvenile crime is up. And the D.C. City Council recently passed this uh, crime bill um, that acknowledges, okay, yes, our our soft on crime strategies don't really seem to be working, but there's not much contained in that crime bill that deals with juvenile offenders. Meanwhile, we're seeing headlines like this. This is from the Washington Post. An 11-year-old's robbery charges were dropped. Then he was arrested again. The child was arrested in connection with an assault and two robberies in May, but the charges were dismissed. Less than two weeks later, he was charged in connection with another robbery. And as infuriating as that headline is, the details of this story are even worse. As the Post writes, in early June, D.C. prosecutors dismissed criminal charges against a notable offender, an 11-year-old who police alleged was responsible for an assault and two robberies the previous month. But the youth, who agreed to stay out of Northwest D.C. and wear an ankle monitor if a probation officer determined it was necessary to resolve the charges, didn't stay out of the court system for long. On Wednesday, he appeared virtually in court again in connection with another robbery. Post goes on to say on June 16th, 11 days. After documents showed the youth's prior charges were dismissed, he was arrested on charges of armed robbery and carrying a pistol without a license. According to a police report, he and two others tried to steal a delivery driver's moped that was parked outside of a Chick-fil-A in Northwest D.C., you know, the part of town that he wasn't supposed to be in, and then threatened to shoot the driver when he objected. D.C. prosecutors said at Wednesday's hearing that the office was, quote, working on a possible plea offer with the youth related to the new charges, which include robbery while armed, Threats to injury a person and carrying a pistol without a license. So here you have a kid, an 11-year-old kid, whose charges were dismissed last month. 11 days later, he's arrested. And the prosecutors immediately start working on a plea deal that's going to offer this troubled young individual, again, few consequences and a slap on the wrist. As I said... Gets worse the more you learn about this case. We're not done yet. During a brief hearing on Wednesday in D.C. Superior Court, the youth, his attorney, his probation officer, and a prosecutor with the city's office of the attorney general appeared virtually before Judge James Crowell. A probation officer said the youth, who has been released into his mother's custody, was compliant with his curfew, but there had been, quote, issues with his GPS bracelet. The probation officer said the youth's mother was concerned about her son's drug use, and the officer asked that he undergo drug testing. He's 11. He's 11, for God's sakes. By the way, he was complying with his curfew. 
He's accused of committing an armed robbery in broad daylight. What does it matter if he was home by 10, if he's committing armed robberies at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? And by the way, what issues were there with the GPS bracelet that he was supposed to wear? Uh, you could even say, I guess from a you know criminal justice reform perspective, why was this 11-year-old wearing an ankle monitor when the charges had been dismissed? If he was dangerous enough that district officials believe that they should be able to keep tabs on him, why did they cut him loose? Why didn't they pursue charges? <sighs> so now the mom says, I'm worried that my 11-year-old's on drugs. He's been arrested, what, twice since May for serious violent felonies. And what's the court's response? Oh, by the way, before we get to that, probation officer also said the mother uh, was having trouble placing her son in school because of his, quote, behavior issues. And he requested that the youth be evaluated to determine if any psychological challenges were affecting his education. You, 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 you know what might be affecting his education? His drug use, his criminal behavior. Despite all of this, the judge said he was, quote, concerned about the youth's issues with his GPS monitor. If things don't improve, he said, I'll have to modify his placement. If things don't get better, I will have to place him in a shelter. Question is, why the hell has that not happened before now? What is going on in the District of Columbia? And by the way, why are gun control activists utterly silent about this? Oh, they'll praise D.C. for passing all kinds of new gun control laws. They don't care how those laws are enforced or not. What really matters to them is getting those laws on the, on the books, right? So then they can turn around and say, well, D.C. did it. So Chicago should do it. And Boston should do it. And then once those cities are done, well, Indianapolis should do it. St. Louis should do it. Kansas City should do it. Dallas should do it. Houston should do it. And then we need to do it at the state level. And then we need to do it at the federal level. It doesn't matter that an 11-year-old who's accused of armed robbery is just being spit back out on the streets. The system isn't functioning. In fact, well, I, I take that back. The system is functioning exactly as district officials allow it to function, which is, of course, not very well at all. This is not a one-off. 11 years old might be a little younger than what we're seeing in D.C., but juvenile crime is up across the district. In fact, it has gotten to the point that Catholic University, you know, uh, uh, Pope Francis, all in favor of gun control, doesn't why anybody needs to own a gun, but Catholic University, oh, they're putting armed police on campus now. Yeah, I guess there's an exception, right? When crime gets so bad, okay, you, you don't want to protect yourself, but yes, we'll, we'll at least allow police on campus. Uh, WUSA, uh, Channel 9 in Washington, D.C., went and spoke with uh, some students and residents near Catholic University. One of them, Michael Howard, asked, when will it end? I guess they're trying to take advantage of people who aren't from here, or they assume are not from here, and they want to try to rob them. I'm walking down the street right now, and I hope I'll make it home safe. There have been two murders near the uh, Catholic University campus. In fact, one murder on the Catholic University campus over the past couple of weeks, a 25-year-old teacher from Kentucky who was allegedly killed by somebody who, again, no stranger to the law in Washington, D.C., but had a lot of dismissed charges, a lot of probationary offenses instead of prison time. And uh, you wonder when it's going to end? Well, I, I think when the district starts to get serious about violent offenders instead of trying to crack down on law-abiding gun owners. Uh, another individual who uh, spoke to WUSA says, this has never happened in the history of my neighborhood. I don't know about that. D.C. has had some dangerous years. But Peter Zimmer says, we're really proud of our neighborhood. We're really shocked. We're really angry that it's so much out of control. We have roving juveniles with guns doing armed robberies here. Indeed you do. What happens when they're caught? They're released. Back to the mom. Even though mom says, I, I can't put my kid in school because of his behavioral issues. My 11-year-old's doing drugs. I need help. The system says, well, when things don't get better, we might have to take your kid from you. Yeah, well, again, how are, how are things supposed to get better? The, I, when, when does the state intervene here? As opposed to shrugging its collective shoulders and saying, you know, what can we do to crack down on concealed carry? That Because that's the real issue here, right? Well, it's not. As a matter of fact... Um, we won't move on from this topic, but let, let's talk about 
And we'll go a little bit out of order here. Well, let's talk about our armed citizen story today. Also from Washington, D.C. Now, the headline from D.C. News Now, I got to tell you, is pathetic, especially considering this is the only local news report I can find about this defensive gun use. Here's the headline. Victim shot man for attempting to steal car. Police looking for additional suspect. Uh, No, that's not what happened. A would-be carjacker was shot by his intended victim, an armed carjacker, by the way. Uh, Again, something that the uh, D.C. media has largely ignored when they do bother to cover it. They absolutely downplay that uh, act of armed self-defense, where a concealed carry holder who had managed to navigate the maze of red tape that D.C. officials put in the way of anybody hoping to exercise their right to keep and bear arms. This guy managed to do it. He got his training outside of the district, managed to uh, jump through all of the hoops and hurdles, got his concealed carry license, and thankfully, he had his firearm on him when these would-be carjackers tried to steal his car. He was able to shoot one of the attackers. The other fled into the night, has not been taken into custody. Uh, The uh, suspect who was shot is in the hospital and may face charges. I say may because who the hell knows? Uh, So many cases are dismissed in D.C. these days. You've got uh, prosecutors and police pointing the fingers at each other as to why that's the case. But the bottom line is, more than half of the time, when you've got somebody arrested for illegally carrying a gun, there's no consequence whatsoever. And even when there are underlying violent charges attached, all too often, these cases, again, are simply being dismissed. Prosecutors say, well, you know, we've got concerns about evidentiary issues with police. The police say prosecutors aren't doing their job. And again, as the fingers get pointed, uh, the violence continues and it ramps up. Now, I don't know about you. I happen to think this is a little bit more important than Jason Aldean's latest single. But Shannon Watts doesn't think so. Mom's Demand Action doesn't think so. Giffords doesn't think so. Uh, uh, singers like Cheryl Crow don't think so. Right? Nah, they're, they're far more interested in uh, going after a song than in talking about what's actually happening in places like Washington, D.C., where the system is failing. In fact, you know, it's not just the system. It sounds like every adult in this 11-year-old's life has failed this kid. From his parents, to the court system, to the education system, there's more than enough blame to go around here. And sadly, again, when it has become abundantly clear that this 11-year-old needs more help than he's getting, What's the response from the courts? Well, if things don't change, uh, we may have to put him in a shelter. If things don't change, you may have to do something about it. After this kid's been arrested twice since May for violent crimes. After his mom says an 11-year-old is doing drugs and she can't stop him. She can't put him in school because of his behavioral issues. Yeah. If things don't change, then maybe, maybe the officials in Washington, D.C. will do something about it. But first, they got to continue cracking down on your right and my right to keep and bear arms. Our right to protect ourselves in an increasingly dangerous city. Now, moving on uh, to today's recidivist report. I realize this kind of is a big recidivist report. Albeit, again, one involving an 11-year-old. Um, let's turn our attention to a, another story out of Louisville, Kentucky. Headline, Just Want Justice. Family of woman killed in Parkland neighborhood reacts to suspect arrest. Uh, and it took a long time for an arrest to be made in this particular killing. It was the day before Thanksgiving last year when 19-year-old Andrea Perks was shot, left in an alley. In the Parkland neighborhood, she later died at a Louisville hospital. Prosecutors arrested 25-year-old DeAndre Wicks this week. According to WLKY, who looked into Wicks' background, he has a, quote, long history of breaking the law. Quote, the convicted felon got a star while still in high school. Wicks was just 18 years old when he was charged with a series of violent robberies. And this is what Jefferson County District Court Judge David Holton told him in 2016, seven years ago. I know you're 18. I know you're young. 
And perhaps this is your first taste of the criminal justice system as an adult. But in setting your bond today, I've got to take into account and into consideration the safety of this community. That was a bond hearing. Well, as it turns out, over the ensuing years, the court system really didn't seem to care much about the safety of the community. 2018, Wicks was charged with being a convicted felon in possession of a firearm, as well as receiving stolen property, fleeing police, and several other crimes. He received a five-year prison sentence, all of which was suspended in lieu of supervised probation. Now, again, that was his second offense. He uh, had already been charged with a series of violent robberies, and apparently had been convicted because he was a felon when he was arrested in possession of a firearm. Last September... When Wick should have been behind bars, but it was instead on supervised probation, prosecutors say he cut off his ankle monitor. A month later, police say he broke into a home, stole guns and jewelry. He wasn't arrested for that burglary until December of 2022, after police say he allegedly murdered the 19-year-old girl. And so once again, we have a uh, situation where somebody who should have been behind bars was instead supposedly supervised, right, by an ankle monitor, cut off that ankle monitor, and what happened? Nothing happened. He got away until he was caught a couple of months later. So what kind of supervision does an ankle monitor actually provide? Not much at all, it seems to me. And um, again, if that five-year prison sentence had been applied, then Wicks Maybe he would have had consequences for the very first time in his life. But he would have been behind bars. And uh, Andrea Perks likely would be alive today. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in, uh, I believe this was in uh, Georgia, Glynn County, Georgia, a man saving two women from a house fire on St. Simon's Island. A uh, very... Scary situation over the weekend. Took place in the uh, Pelican Place neighborhood. Bennett Birch is the uh, good Samaritan in question who was in the right place at the right time, wasn't able to do the right thing. Uh, Kara Zambetti uh, lives at uh, Pelican Place. She and a neighbor, uh, Preston Delaney, said they watched the whole scene unfold. Say it was terrifying to watch. Delaney said, I'll never forget how fast the house went up in the heat, how far away from the house you could feel the heat. Uh, Zambetti said, I, I barely got to the driveway. I was just screaming Gale and Dawn to make sure they were out. And you could feel the heat. She says, I have no idea how he was in there. It was intense. Gail Staley lost her home in the fire, but her life was saved. She said, I'm very blessed. The people are safe. The kitties are safe. My water critters are safe. We can replace all the material. Bennett Birch was just in the area getting ready to pick up some friends before they went to the beach. He saw the flames on the front porch of the home and then rushed into action. Uh, Gail Staley said he came running up the stairs, couldn't get out, get out, your house is on fire. So immediately I ran down the stairs, he grabbed my hand, brought us out into the front yard. Uh, Bird says his adrenaline kicked in, he acted without hesitation. He said, I don't know, it, it, the adrenaline just kind of hit, I didn't really think about it. As, as we were coming down the stairs, the flames were going up. The uh, Glen County Fire Department says the fire is caused by an electrical issue. Um, and again, the home, a total loss, but the lives inside saved. And this is, I think, especially emotional for Gail Staley because 25 years ago almost, she said she lost her son in a fire. She said, once you've lost a child, material things don't matter. So we are fine. Thank you. We're fine, she said. And again, that is because of the quick thinking and the fast action of Bennett Birch in the right place at the right time willing and able to do the right thing to save the lives of strangers. So, Mr. Birch, we thank you for your very good deed. And I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, uh, again, we really do appreciate you tuning in. I'm looking forward to being back with you on Monday. Uh, Stay far away from Washington, D.C., if you can, (laughs) over the course of the weekend. Hopefully that won't be too difficult for you. Uh, And uh, I'm looking forward again to being back with you on Monday. We'll uh, have much more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation at bearingarms.com between now and Monday. So make sure you're checking out the website. we got you covered there. And if you like what you see, I'd also encourage you to become a VIP member of Bearing Arms or even a VIP gold member of the entire Town Hall Media family of websites. All you have to do, go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. 
and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership in exchange. And as a token of our appreciation, we're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. News stories and analysis that matter because your support matters and makes a difference. So thank you again. All right. Enjoy your weekend to come. We'll see you back here on Monday. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.